For over 3,000 years, the land that we today know as Egypt was home to one of the greatest continuous civilizations in the history of the world. The absolute rulers of Egyptian society, the pharaohs, were god kings on earth who could command men and resources that even today would be difficult for the leaders of most nations. For example, take the Great Pyramid of Khufu, built in the 3rd millennium BC and nearly 1500 meters in height. It was the tallest man-made structure in the world for nearly 4,000 years. The Great Pyramid, though, is just one such monument. There are over 100 different pyramids of various sizes all over Egypt. Let's also not forget the hundreds of temples that have been discovered, some of the most famous being at Karnak, Abu Simbel, and Medina Tabu. These temple complexes were gigantic and dwarfed most religious structures in other parts of the ancient world. Politically, Egypt was a force to be reckoned with, especially after the 16th century BC, when the Egyptian pharaohs of the 18th dynasty embarked on military campaigns to expand their dominion and create an empire that rivaled those of the other great powers of their day. In this series, we'll cover every ancient Egyptian dynasty and nearly 170 pharaohs, from 3100 BC until the annexation of Egypt into the Roman Empire in the year 30 BC. That's over 3,000 years. It's an absolutely epic story of a people and their perseverance throughout antiquity. However, let's not get ahead of ourselves, for we have some things to cover before that. It's important to realize that the ancient Egypt we're familiar with today didn't start in a vacuum. There were many civilizations that occupied the fertile lands around the Nile River long before the first pharaoh. Some may be lost to us, but many of these prehistoric cultures have been discovered. We already talked about several of them and what life was like in Egypt while they were flourishing, so we won't spend much time on them here with the exception of one, the Nakada culture. This culture, also pronounced Nagada, was dominant in Egypt roughly between the years 3900 to 3100 BC, and was important because the religion, art, and iconography that ancient Egypt is so well known for today really began to crystallize during this period. Though its main centers seem to have been in and around the ancient sites of Abydos, Hierakonpolis, and Nakada in Upper Egypt, artifacts from this culture have also been found far to the north in the Nile Delta region, as well as to the south in Nubia. Most of what we know about the Nakada culture comes from the numerous ancient cemeteries that have been excavated by archaeologists since the 1800s. Life in Nakada villages revolved around farming and herding, with crops such as wheat and barley being grown, and cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs being domesticated for food consumption. With most settlements being found within proximity to the Nile, fishing was also an important and relatively stable source of food. Over time though, the settlements of Abydos, Hierakonpolis, and Nakada grew with regard to their populations, complexity, and sophistication. By 3200 BC, they probably started to resemble small cities. Though some unity of culture and religion seems to have spread throughout Egypt at the time, politically, the country was divided. The answer to the question of just how Egypt unified into a single state has been debated by scholars since shortly after the discovery of the Rosetta Stone in the 1820s enabled them to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics. Egyptian tradition has it that there were once two states or kingdoms. This is because there are many references in Egyptian texts to the unification of the two lands, as well as the pharaonic title, King of Upper and Lower Egypt. Archaeological findings, though, seem to indicate that the political reality may have been a bit more complex than that. It's likely that there were several little kingdoms and petty city-states that eventually came together, either through war or trade, to form a single, politically unified Egypt. Historical sources all seem to agree that the first kings of a united Egypt came from Thinis, 
a city that has yet to be discovered, but that's well documented in both ancient Egyptian and Greek sources as being somewhere close to the city of Abydos in Upper Egypt. But how did these kings from a so far undiscovered city unite the country under one banner? Not too far from Nakada is a limestone cliff with scores of primitive drawings and texts in multiple languages that have been etched into the rock throughout the ages. Basically a form of ancient graffiti, one particular set of images depicting birds, snakes, and what seems to be a bull's skull upon a staff stands out. Within this group of markings are also a man clasping a club in one hand and a rope with a prisoner in the other. Along with these is what's unmistakably a scorpion. About 640 kilometers south of Nakada, near the Nile's second cataract in what's today Sudan, are similar markings, this time featuring an image of a scorpion dangling a man between its claws, and two other figures standing nearby. One of them is holding a bow and arrow aimed at the head of the scorpion's prey. Archaeologists have dated both etchings to around 3200 BC. Though it may simply be a coincidence, several scholars now believe that the etchings may be linked to a man who was laid to rest in a large, 12-chambered tomb discovered in 1989 by German archaeologists at the site of Abydos. Though looted and with the body missing, the tomb held many clues that it was the final resting place of a king associated with the sign of a scorpion. For this reason, we call him King Scorpion. On many of the jars and local wares found inside the tomb were also renderings of a bull's head set up on a post, along with about 60 drawings of scorpions. Basically, the same motifs and signs that were found on the rock graffiti near Nakada and by the second cataract in Nubia. Archaeologists have determined that the tomb once held food items, jars of wine, obsidian, ivory, gold, and boxes of linens. Carbon-14 dating has indicated that these objects were placed in the tomb between the years 3200 to 3100 BC. In addition, the early hieroglyphs on labels of the remaining grave goods seem to identify many cities and towns in Egypt. This has led many scholars to believe that these were all areas that this so-called King Scorpion may have held authority over. And it could also be possible that the scorpion etchings found on the two stone cliffs were to mark territory that he ruled over, or at least campaigned in. With such little information though, it's very difficult to know for sure. Around 3100 BC, another man seems to enter the historical record. One who, as far as we can tell, became an extremely important king. In 1897, British archaeologists James Kibble and Frederick Green were excavating the ruins of a mound at Hierakonpolis. There had once been a temple dedicated to the god Horus on top of the mound, but most of that was long gone, save for a few sandstone blocks. It was there, though, that Kibble and Green dug up what turned out to be a cache of objects, the likes of which had never been seen. There was a golden image of a hawk, with eyes made of obsidian, and two life-size pharaonic statues made of copper that turned out to be of Pharaoh Pepi I and his son, Marenre, of the Sixth Dynasty. In addition to these were two intricately carved sandstone pallets, slaughtering knives, hundreds of pieces of carved ivory, and numerous engraved mace heads. According to Green's notes, this temple cache had been deposited into three main groups. The first, which included the two copper statues and the golden hawk, had been dated to around the 24th century BC. The second, which was composed of numerous figurines and other objects, was believed to have been a few hundred years older, perhaps dating to the first few dynasties of Egypt. The third group was the strangest of all, because it contained objects that were quite rare in their design when compared to other known Egyptian artifacts. We now know that many of them were reminiscent of the Nakada culture, and it was within this group that the engraved mace heads and two siltstone pallets 
belonged. On this latter object was the name of a king, spelled out in what might be one of the earliest examples of Egyptian hieroglyphic writing. The glyph read, Narmer, who today scholars recognize as being the first pharaoh of Egypt. At the time of discovery, nobody knew who Narmer was, but eventually, he was thought by many to have been the king known as Menes, who was found in the Egyptian priest Menito's work, Egyptieka, meaning history of Egypt in Greek. Written in the 3rd century BC, the Egyptieka was a major chronological source for the reigns of the rulers of ancient Egypt, and for a time was all that we had until hieroglyphic writing was deciphered. According to Menito, Menes was the first pharaoh of Egypt who unified the two lands, specifically Upper and Lower Egypt. Though there is by no means any sort of unanimous agreement amongst Egyptologists, information from these objects, along with several others discovered with Scorpion and Narmer's names on them, have allowed scholars to come up with the following basic narrative of the early political history of Egypt. It goes something like this. King Scorpion was a powerful ruler in Upper Egypt. Although he originally may have held court in Hierakonpolis, Scorpion eventually moved his capital to Thinis. This may have been because it was closer to Lower Egypt and the Nile Delta region, which he may have sought to absorb into his growing domain. It's also possible that he may have already acquired much of this region, since his name has been found on artifacts discovered close to the modern Egyptian capital of Cairo. Again, we can't say for sure, because the evidence is limited. However, the next king, Narmer, who may or may not have been his son, did eventually conquer all of Lower Egypt, which is demonstrated by the scenes on the Narmer palette where he's depicted wearing the white and red crowns that represent Upper and Lower Egypt, respectively. As you can see, this outline of events leaves out many details and may or may not be completely accurate but it seems to be the best that we have at the moment. Egyptology is by no means an exact science, and the further we go back in time, the more gaps and questions start to surface. For example, problems in chronology arise when recently discovered inscriptions from the eastern and western deserts seem to indicate the existence of other kings before the reign of Narmer. Who were these men, and where were they from? Were they related to the kings from Thinis, or are they from other cities? Because of this confusion as to who was related to whom and ruled from where, Egyptologists collectively group these rulers into what they call Dynasty Zero. It's a bit of a misleading term because the word dynasty means a single ruling line, and because of this, many scholars instead use the term pre-dynastic kings or pre-dynastic era. Nevertheless, Dynasty Zero is the more common term, and so far has stuck. It's believed that Narmer was married to a woman named Nithhotep. Since royal marriages in the ancient world were almost always politically motivated, Nithhotep was likely a princess from another royal family. If this was indeed the case, then such a marriage would have no doubt strengthened Narmer's position, and may have given him more legitimacy, as well as greater strength, to rule over all of Egypt. The two would eventually go on to have a son, Hor Aha. Inheriting a united Egypt from his father, Hor Aha would become the first pharaoh of what scholars call Egypt's first dynasty, or Dynasty I. We'll talk about this and more as we travel dynasty by dynasty through the history of ancient Egypt. Stay tuned. As always, thanks so much for stopping by. I sincerely appreciate it. I'd also like to thank GrandKek69, Yap de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Danny Van Eck, Wanix TV, Robert Morgan, Frank, Tim Lane, Candice Whipple, Brendan Redman, Faridun Dadachanji, Sher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description.
You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as continue to listen to audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe. <laughs>